Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 171, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How's it going, everybody? How's it feeling, huh? I'm here, hanging out in the depths of Stratford with a little cup of coffee in me hand. It's been a while, hasn't it, eh? It's been a bloody while. Hope you guys are well. Hope you guys are well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated, um, nice and limber. Your mobility is where it should be. And yeah, happy Monday, man. Happy bloody Monday. I know for some of you lot, you hate Monday. Let me just adjust this camera here a little bit and get me down a bit. I know some of you guys are obje- are kind of super against Mondays and Mondays for you are like, you know, hell on earth. But, you know, me personally, as I said many, many a times, Monday's always a great opportunity to kind of start the week, um, start a fresh, start a new, turn over a new page, new leaf, whatever metaphor you want to use. And the beginning of the week is, you know, it's the beginning of your of, of your, a whole new life for you. Um, I'm not one of the people that's like, um, you know, people do that thing where like, oh, I'm going to start this thing next week on Monday. I, I'm not that, I'm not that, um, I'm not that pedantic about it, but I do like the idea of like, you know, you rest on Sunday and then you start again on Monday, going hard and getting F after it as much as you can. And um, for me personally, this part, last couple of weeks or the week that I've just gone by where I haven't uploaded, um, I'm, t- I'm telling myself I took a break, but I didn't really take a break. If anything, I let the circumstances of life make me take a break. And um, usually that's not something that I tend to do. I tend to always kind of um, fight against my um, um, the kind of my lizard brain, right? Um, the kind of lazy monkey inside of me. I try and fight against it and try and make sure that I power through the things I don't want to do in order for me to do the things that I want to do. And also in order for me to kind of, you know, um, reinforce some kind of... Um, uh resolution some, some some kind of resolute framework within within me so i can withstand more things but i guess last week it all came a bit to a head i kind of got a bit down in the dumps um and i wouldn't say i got would i even say i got down in the dumps i just i just started thinking too much you know like for i think for me personally i'm not sure for anyone else but i tend to do a lot of things in order to kind of stop me from thinking which is probably not the best idea of, of resolving the issues that I may be going through inside of my head, right? But I tend to do a lot of things, keep myself busy, so I don't have to think. Um, I tend to kind of cut myself off. I, I tend to kind of like, you know, um, pull myself away from people and try and hear myself in the corner just so I can like not think about shit and just concentrate on what I'm going to do because that's the only thing that I can control, right? And there is a element of truth that, right? I can only control what I can control. But I think sometimes in life, you have to be able to speak about the things that you're going through or to maybe speak openly about the troubles you're having. Maybe, um, you know, you're low in confidence. Maybe there's things that are troubling you. Maybe there's things that you want to have clarification on. Maybe you just want somebody to just have a shoulder to cry on or an an ear to listen to, whatever it may be. It's really important to kind of verbalize and to really put out what to to kind of like say out, say aloud, right? Whatever you're going through. And I guess I'm speaking to myself because this is you not know, something that I kind of tend to go through. But I tend not to do that. I tend to kind of keep everything. Be, um, I kind of tend to keep my cards close to my chest, if not staple to my fucking chest. I don't let anyone kind of inside and want to what I'm thinking generally. And most of it has to do with just my kind of you know warped thinking, where I think no one can really help me, right? Because I'm I, I, I always think like I'm on my own little solo path that not a lot of people are doing right i'm trying to do so many things at the same time i'm trying to juggle all these different um different gigs different occupations um in order for me to kind of reach the kind of uh the utopia of being able to kind of be self-sufficient and to kind of you know um live my life um kind of you know turn my lifestyle into a business as the one under Aaron Bondrov once said but I think during that journey, you have to kind of, you know, if you need some help, you kind of have to like, you know, ask for some help. And I guess I haven't over the time. And last week, it kind of came a bit to a head. And I kind of got into a situation where in order to kind of numb the pain, in order for me to kind of feel human again, <laughs> I want to feel human again. <laughs> in order to numb the pain, I sort of dragged myself into oblivion for the most part. Um, uh, Between, I don't know, Sunday to Monday or Monday to Sunday of the week before last or whatever it was. Um, and then, yeah, it just got a bit, it got a bit weird, man. It got a bit weird. It got a bit weird. I kind of, loads of time went by. And then what I realized is that I think for the most part, we always, you realize it when you go out, right? You realize it when you go outside and, or when you go raving or when you go meet your friends up for a party or whatever, whatever you do on the weekends. What you realize is that sometimes when you go to the things that you don't, you, you know, you know, the thing that you go to and you think, oh, I should have probably, I shouldn't have went to that. Or no, the thing that you're going to go to and you have doubts about going there. And then, the, the, and then the next morning when you've got a bang in the hangar, be like, oh man, I knew I shouldn't have went. What you tend, what you tend to realise is that sometimes the, the fact that you're going is usually an indication that you're running away from something, right? Something's troubling you, something's like, you know, um, 
what you call it, uh, scratching away at the back of your head, and you're like, fuck this, fuck, fuck dealing with it, fuck meditating, fuck really analyzing what's going on and getting to the root of the problem because that's that's fucking scary. I'm gonna just go somewhere, I prefer being to a dark room, hook up with a stranger, and drink myself into oblivion, right, or whatever it may be. And then when you realize that in the morning when you wake up in this in a stranger's house somewhere in the middle of South London, you realize that oh shit, actually. That isn't the best way to go about things because that issue is still there. It's still uh, slapping you right bang in the face. And that's what I kind of realized. Um, Again, I have sympathy for people that are alcohol alcohol dependent, right? Or alcoholics and stuff. Or people that have uh, suffered from real bad drug abuse. I know I don't suffer from things because for the most part, I can go cold turkey and just like cut them out. I've done it plenty of times. I'm currently doing it now. Um, But I really, I think in that moment, I really had a lot of sympathy for people that do go through them issues. Because there's something quite, um, there is something ultimately very, very lonely about going through that sort of issue. And imagine the power of people that go through that daily, right? Where they have so many problems that they're having to kind of, you know, numb the pain through the use of alcohol and stuff. And I just felt really sad for them, right? Like, because there's nothing anyone can do for you, really. You kind of have to go through that whole rigmarole, that whole hurdle of fucking nonsense, right? Yourself, really. You have to, that's what you have to do. You have to hope you come out of it the other side. Hope, because again, there's no guarantee that you will come out of it the other side. You kind of have to hope you will. Um, but yeah, by and large, it was a bit of a dark time, but I kind of came out of it, um, I think, pretty well. Um, again, the best thing that I did in order to kind of rectify the issue was something that kind of worked straight away with working out. Um, the next morning, I kind of went worked out in the morning, went for a long run, went back to the gym in the evening for a quick pump. And I felt so much better. And again, it only works for me. I'm not going to say for everyone else. I know sometimes I listen to Joe Rogan. I'm so some, some Joe Rogan fans out there get a bit annoyed whenever Joe Rogan's talking to somebody that suffers from mental health issues. And he's always like, oh, you should work out more. You should go and eat healthy food and shit. And it, comes, it, can, it can come across a bit dismissive, right? Like that is a solution to solve all people's ills just to kind of work out and pump weights. But I think for me, for, my de- um, for, for the way that I'm wired, my deposition, I benefit a lot from that. Um, I like the idea of like stressing and straining my body and reaching the point where I want to give up, but still kind of persevering and pushing through. And at the end of the workout, figuring out, you know what, everything I was worrying about prior to the workout isn't that big of a deal. It's not as big of a deal as I thought it would be. Um, And again, that's something that really worked, really, 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 really worked well for me. And then on top of that, just really calming things down and taking things bit by bit, step by step. Okay, cool. What can I do now? How can I like? How, how can I make my life better from today? Right? Not going, not being super esoteric about it. Not thinking, oh my god, I've wasted five years. Just like, okay, what can I do now? What can I do in the next twenty minutes? What can I do in the next hour? And then little by little, I slowly and slowly but surely dug myself out of the pit, um, like Batman did in um, uh, the Dark Knight Returns when Bane chucked him into that fucking pit. I slowly came out of darkness, and here I am now. Nice and light and shiny. So light and shiny that I've got the white glasses on today. You know what I mean? That's how you know I'm in a good mood. Um, but yeah, apart from that, pretty good um, week. Um, um, quite quiet on the DJ front. It's going to be ramping up again in um, the second week of April. So look out for that. I'll make some announcements when that happens. Because today, a lot of holiday-wise, not really doing anything, am I? Not really. Uh, Berlin, I'm going to kind of push it to the back burner, especially since what happened last week. I'm going to kind of give it a bit of time before I go to Berlin. And I want to, I want to make Berlin a treat. I think sometimes, you know, I realize, I think that epiphany I had when I went to Berlin last time was like, oh, you know, I don't need to come here all the time. I have Berlin at home. You can, you know, I was, I was going there um, seeking hedonistic experiences, which I did really great party time, but I've got the same stuff here. Right. But it, it, it's made even, it's made, um, Berlin is made uh, more desirable when you kind of abstain from going out every single night here in London. I think for me personally, I don't I don't necessarily get the whole like rolling out of bed, um, ro- rolling out of bed to go to a party in London, rolling in bed to go to a party, party in fucking Berlin. That's making sense to me. I'd rather have a bit of distance and kind of pull it to one side. But yeah, that's been pre- best thing what I've been doing. Um, be- much In a much, much better place overall. Um, but yeah, let's crack onto the, the episode and get talking about some things that I saw during the week ba 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 what have i seen here um oh so number one thing actually i was going to speak about i was listening to it now recently um there's a really good um, jordan peterson video where he's talking about um bible it's, it's, it's his bible lecture series right and i kind of um got put onto it because recently jordan peterson had a um he was meant to be doing a, a bunch of lectures at cambridge U- university i think um this year but you know, due to the fact that some people out there think Jordan Peterson is like you know, um, 
God's answer to Marlon Yapalopoulos, whatever his name is, they decided to rescind his offer. So now he's no longer going to be um, lecturing at Cambridge. But the whole idea behind the lecture there was he's going to be like a Bible tour. So I've decided to kind of go back and listen to a lot of the Bible lecture series that he did a couple of years ago. I didn't really listen to them because I didn't think they'll be of of use. But listen to them now, they're really, really interesting. And there's a part, and I think I'm kind of 20 minutes through the first bit of the Abraham uh, portion of it. And it's something that he mentions about, you know, he kind of mentions um, quite often that life's purpose isn't about, life isn't, life's purpose isn't happiness, right? Life's purpose is about making sure you are built up in a way that you can um, withstand life's um, constant flurry of disappointment, right? That's what he meant. You meant to kind of train yourself up to be kind of resolute um, in order to kind of get through that pain. It's not, it's not about seeking happiness because any, any, anyone, knows, we all know how to enjoy, intrinsically, we all know how to enjoy happy times, right? We all know how to kind of smell the roses, but can you battle through and come back after setback, after setback, after setback? And there was an idea behind it that, you know, you have to do a lot, right? You, there's, there's this idea that resp- you have to take responsibility for your life, right? You have to kind of, you know, put the burden on your own shoulders and really try to kind of make the best of your life and what you can um, from the little time you have available to you. And I guess thinking about it for me, that's what happened. That's that's where the kind of breakdown for me happened last week or the week before, where I was kind of thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing so much already. I'm still only seeing a, a, a kind of minuscule amount of progress. And it just kind of dawned on me, like, what the fuck? Like, I know I don't want to go and be average Joe guy, right? And just like be happy to kind of work somewhere, pick up a check. Um, go on your holiday here and there. I know I don't want that kind of lifestyle at all whatsoever, but there was something about it. I was like, you know what? Is there is there more nobility in the idea of being average Joe guy where you kind of know your place and you know exactly what, you know exactly where your potential lies or the limits of your potential um, and you enjoy the fruits of the, if you, you enjoy the fruits of your labor without any kind of regret, right? Or any kind of uh, longing for other things or any kind of FOMO. But, you know, in my life, my life is, predominantly based on FOMO right it's layered FOMO in general right it's not FOMO on other people's lives it's FOMO on what I should be doing but then I think listening to that lecture series it kind of got me thinking like no actually that is my responsibility I take the responsibility of trying to forge a, a path ahead for myself that involves living a life that I don't have to you know um uh be an average Joe that's going to require some it's going to require me to go through some painful times and I'm okay with that to be honest but again you just need to re- you just need to kind of in, in, you need to kind of see it in your face again to hear someone say it again like Jordan Peterson remind you again that you know this is what this is your life's calling right you've been called to a life of adventure I answered the call um the first time I, re- I, I read um on the road um by um Jack Kerouac it just spoke to me right it didn't speak to me in a way of like oh, I'm gonna grab a I'm gonna go and hitchhike all across um middle America but it spoke to me in the idea of like that's what I want to do right I want to have a life of adventure I want to go out there and chase my dreams and it kind of sparked something in me. And I think for some people, it just doesn't, right? Some people just read that as a story. But I guess the fact that it sparked something in me, it's my duty then, right? It's my duty to my family and to my name to take that mantle and try and forge ahead. And that's what exactly I'm going to try and do. And again, it's going to it's gonna be some dark times. There's going to be some moments where I want to fucking jump off the side of a building. But by and large, right, if I continue forging ahead, I think when I'm old and grey and shit, I'm already kind of grey now if you look through the middle part and anyway, but yeah, when I'm, when I'm older and greyer, um, I'm going to be happy that I tried, man. That's it. I'm just going to be happy that I, I gave it a go. I think that's the one thing I don't want to live a life of any kind of regret and so far, I don't feel I have any regret, man. No, not really. I'm, tr- I'm trying my best, you know. It's probably not as the, enough. I'm probably on your praying at 50%. I'm probably interested to see what my life would look like if I committed 85%, 90%, 95%, 100%. To really get in my shit in order, like Jordan Peterson said, and really trying to make something of myself, and I'm sure the benefits of that will be, you know, far flung. The ripple effect of that will be fucking awesome. I'm sure people nearest and closest to me will also feel the vibes, feel the vibes of my journey somewhere or rather or the other. But anyway, that's something I've been thinking about the last couple of weeks. Um, just thought I'd share that with you. But anyway, let's crack on some topics I've been speaking about. I've been thinking about um speaking about things like a lot. Some topics for the week. Um number one here. Da-da-da-da. So um talking about sacrifice talking about giving it all talking about doing what needs to be done. Oh my fucking hell. Something always got always got bloody eggs stuck in my mouth. Pardon me for the guys that don't like eggs, but hey. Um talking about um sacrificing and being the best that you can be. There's this great article that I saw recently on um Marca, right? The 
national newspaper of Spain, the one that usually kind of breaks all the big transfer stories. And it's a story on Zidane, right? Um, I'm guessing this is kind of an, during the, for the run-up of him, you know, returning back to Real Madrid. Um, you know, the less, said, the less said about Zidane's legend, the better. If you don't know about Zidane, go and shoot yourself, whatever. But Zidane, Zidane, the great Real Madrid, Juventus, France, n- numerous other um, clubs, uh, player, recently had a little short interview, right? And the interview is titled Zidane. As a player, I slept well, didn't go to bars and only drank water. I know, it's just, it's a little bit OTT because, of course, you know, this is Zidane, but I'm glad sometimes you have a... I'm glad we have these little snapshots into the highest performers out there, right? I'm glad sometimes, you know, we don't really hear much from Zidane. He's a man of a few words, right? But I'm glad when they do speak, they ask these kind of questions about, you know, how they were able to kind of, you know play at such a high level um, um, during, you know, the latter stage of their career. And I like that most of the time, there are those genetic freaks that exist, right? There are those players out there who can go out, you know, do lines of coke, drink loads, bang tons of prostitutes, and still be able to go score a hat-trick on a Sunday. But I'm, I'm glad that some of the best performing athletes that we have at the moment in all various different sports that you can name, from basketball to football to tennis, for the most part, live an incredibly disciplined lifestyle, right? An incredibly disciplined lifestyle where they sacrifice nearly everything for their profession or for their career of choice, right? In order to kind of reach the heady heights that they want to reach. And sometimes they still come up short. And I like that because I think sometimes for us mere mortals, right? For us regular civilians, we can sometimes get a bit, you know, we can sometimes... um fool ourselves into thinking that what they're doing isn't that difficult right that you could do it too um that it doesn't take that much effort blah 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 but sometimes i like in black and white when they just say to you hey this is what i did to in order to kind of get to what i want to get to imagine doing that for 30 years day in day out christmases birthdays um anniversaries whatever it may be called imagine the amount of stuff he has missed out in his career overall but zidane kind of um, mentions in his article right and the article says the following Zidane's journey to the top of professional football has been a long and uh, odious one. The Frenchman spent the last five um, five years of his playing career at Real Madrid, right? The last five years, which is fucking amazing. Win the Champions League, La Liga, um, alongside the greats Ronaldo, Real, and Luis Figa. However, but his first attempt to the game weren't quite glamorous. It was quite clear. It was clear to me from the start. He told um, o- OTRO. Um, all I wanted to do was play football, but I had difficulties at school and my parents told me off, so I was a bit of a bad kid, right, growing up. I knew full well that I didn't have a, a, an, an ideal attitude. Then one day they told me, we know you have something, you're on your mind, so do what you want to, so do what you want to do. Once I had my parents' permission, right, which is something, again, something that goes without saying, I think for me personally, I've never had my parents' permission in the things I've done. I've always kind of had to fight and convince them that what I'm doing is the right thing. And again, I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea because I think sometimes coming from a household where everything's a challenge, everything's a no, I think it toughens you up for the outside world. When someone then tries to tell you what to do or how to do things outside of your house, you're like, go fuck yourself, right? Uh, I've had enough I've had enough to hear my mum and dad telling me it. You're not going to tell me it. But what again, like I said before, I think it just strengthens your argument. It strengthens your resolve. You're a little bit more ready for the world when you get no's at home. But I'm also aware that sometimes with some kids, the the the, um, the idea that you have permission, the idea that your parents have said you're allowed and you've got, that's not in the back of your head. That's not worrying anymore. You're not worrying that um, you're not kind of, it's not holding you down when you go out on trial. I think that's really important because I've been to many a football trials with my little brother and you can tell from the kids hanging around, the ones that have permission from their parents and the ones that don't. And it weighs down on them when they're playing, right? They're not even expressing themselves in the way that they should be because they're afraid of what's going to happen when they get back home, right? Um, but again, I think there's different ways of parenting. For me personally, I quite like the idea that I always had conflict. It's always kind of a wall to hit, a wall that I had to kind of scale over, dig under, go around. Um, because again, like I said, it trained me for the outside world. Um, once, I had my, once I had my parents' permission, I focused on giving everything to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Um, on arriving to, at Cannes, his first club, I saw professional training and told myself, I want to do this, right? And that's always a great thing. I remember the first time I went to a, a semi-professional football football ground training session and they've all got the great kits on, they've all got nice boots, the, the grass is cut immaculately. Like, it's just like, wow, right? You're like, okay, this is where you want to be. Um, from this moment on, I did everything I could to become the best. After going to Cannes at the age of 17, Zidane changed his lifestyle in order to get to the top of the game. I slept well. I wasn't an idiot going around bars. I only drank water and did stretches. 
I put everything into becoming the best player possible. I told I had to do it. I had to do it at all costs. Um, this is how I could make my parents happy because it was my life. But I also did it to make them proud. To make yourself known and then play, you had to be good. Not like today. First, you had to show that you were different to everyone else because at the time there were a limited number of players, only one or two youngsters per team. Today, it will change. It, it goes much quicker. And as for players, they are no longer afraid of making mistakes, which is true, right? But that's the big thing here, right? I slept well. I was an idiot going around bars, only drank water and did stretches. Imagine the era that Zidane grew up in, right? Imagine that kind of era of football player where, you know, standards weren't as high as they maybe are now. There was maybe a, a bigger dearth of talent worldwide, but standards weren't as high. So you could probably get away with doing a line or two, right? And if you if you don't believe me, look up, look up the player Antonio Cassano, right? He's got a very interesting past and he was in a similar kind of generation as um, Zinedine Zidane, right? A lot of players out there who were able to kind of, you know, have a drink, go out, date models, go to fucking film, can go to film, um, um, uh, what you call it, premieres and stuff, whatever it may be, and just live that lifestyle and still be able to balance things around. Like uh, David Beckham was probably a good example of it. But you have to imagine if you're a David Beckham, you're a Zinedine Zidane, you're already involved in a celebrity lifestyle of being, you know, maybe you've got like a, a, a very popular spouse in Dave Beckham's case with Victoria Beckham or in Zidane, you have kind of the marquee Adidas um, athlete. There's already obligations on you in terms of sponsorship and marketing, right? You're having to devote a lot of time into kind of getting that shit done. And then on top of that, you're having to maintain the standards of a professional football player, right? You want to win the Golden Boot. You want to win the Ballon d'Or. You want to be the world's best player of the year. These kind of constraints that are kind of like banging away at you. Some of them as well are external. Some of them are internal. Then, to you to, then for you to decide you have no vices, right? That you're going to commit to a life of sleeping, right? Not going out around bars and drinking only water and doing yoga. That's insane. But that also shows why he was able to achieve such insane goals, such insane achievements in his career. There's no, there's no, um, I think a lot of people, I think especially when you read people's comments and shit on stuff or replies, I know for the most part people are trolls, I get it, I get it. But there is sometimes, I do look at those kind of comments and think there are some humans behind those comments. And I think sometimes when you look at these people from the outside looking, I know for me sometimes it can, and even speaking on my end, I know sometimes it can be a little bit, oh, how the fuck did he get there, right? You can, you can have those feelings inside your head, but I like, I'd want to assure most people that there are no coincidences in the world. There is no coincidence. There's no lucky break. There's no, um, oh, this person knows that person. That's why they're, they're where they are. No. For the most part, it's fucking doggy determination and it's sacrifices of a level that most people cannot even comprehend, right? It's insane level of sacrifices that kind of um, eventually will lead to you getting to somewhere that you want to get to. Now, it's not always, it doesn't always lead to you to get into the promised land, but that journey is what life is about, right? There's no point of living if you don't go through that journey. But sometimes I think there is a lack of understanding of just how much it takes to achieve what you want to achieve. And that is an example of it, right? Like I said, like Zidane, Zidane made it pro quite young. He probably had every every opportunity to kind of indulge in his vices or temptation come his way. And he didn't. And then we saw the fruits of his labor later on down the line. He's able to maintain a very high standard of playing all the way until when he retired. And that's fucking incredible. But again, like I said, there are no coincidences. He slept a lot. Um, he didn't go out at all, right? Um, I, I guess it might help because he, he might be religious. I'm assuming he might probably is re quite um, heavily religious, but still, just because you're religious it doesn't mean you adhere to what your religion says. He made a decision to kind of be steadfast, put his head down, work, and then look what happened. Look what happened. He's, he's kind of hard work matched his talent. And I guess that's somewhere people, again, need to kind of realize, like, if all the talented people in the world decide to work hard, we're all fucked. Best key, right? So the only thing we have is hard work. We have to hope a couple of talented people, you know, think their shit don't stink, they won't turn up, and then you get a chance to show up. But if all the talented people in the world had work ethic that for someone that, doesn't, that wasn't talented, everyone would be fucked in this world. But it's, it's not. That's why it's a bit more evenly spread and you can do what you need to do. But I thought that was a quite interesting article. It's on Marker. You can find it on the interwebs and it's titled Zidane. As a player, I slept well and didn't go to bars and drank water. Very, very... little. Again, a little small article, but something that I think is a good reminder as to how what it takes to achieve... Um, top top honors in any kind of arena next on list here average cost of a night out duh, 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 duh. so a little article here um from bbc news um regarding how much it costs to go out um in london uh in, in the uk for a night out now 
for you, for those of you guys listening via the, via the podcast app or watching via YouTube, what would you guess would be the average cost of going out on a night out in the UK? What would you guess it would be? Whatever you'd guess it would be, it's high, right? Let's get this article up and read it for us. Like, I read it, I was like, oh my God. So, this is from uh, the BBC News and it says the following. Um, the, the headline is people spend £69 on average on a UK night out, says report. Um, UK consumers are spending close to £69 on a night out on average, according to a report. Spending in January to March was up to 15.9% and £59. Um, the quarterly index is published by Deltic. Deltic boss Peter Mark said, given the pressures on UK retailing, it was fantastic and perhaps surprising to see many Britons feel positively about local leisure offerings. Spending on food was up uh, 11.7% 11, 11, uh, at 16, £16.20. Spending on drinks is up 10.3% and spending on transport is up to 32%. Revelers are also going out more and staying out for longer compared to 12 months ago, which is surprising to me. I don't, I don't, I've not really seen that on my nights out, DJing or just going out and stuff, but I guess this report is what it says. Some 60% of people, of consumers, are said to have, uh, are said to be going out at least once a week and the average night out now lasts for... for uh, four hours 35 minutes more than half of the respondents also expressed positive statements about their local town city but again i say that four hours 35 minutes is probably based on bar time right not like clubbing which is i guess is that that includes all of it i don't know what i'm talking about i guess it's right i guess that's what it means um pressures but there is still demand for better transport more leisure and casual um dining options more, come on they, they want more dining options bruv you can't you can't throw a rock in most UK cities and not find a fucking galley of restaurants. This is surprising given the ongoing news of casual dining outlet closures across the UK due to cost of macroeconomic pressures, including Brexit, business rates, and high rents. Bruv, there's restaurants opening all the time, actually, every other day. Um, people, people spend 15% more than that. Oh, da, da, da. So it was down. In, but that makes more sense, though, innit? Think about it, no? This, this list here. These months are usually quite low because people are, I guess, so from October to August it makes sense because people are usually going to festivals and shit. So they're not maybe going out in town saving money. November, of course, is maybe a dead month because people is cold and people with their families. Um, I don't know. Maybe the weather's improving. I have no idea. Uh, personal face-to-face -face, um, recommendations are the most important factor when choosing a night out. 55% using it as a decision-making process. Uh, this is followed by Facebook. Uh recommendations the deltic night out index according to the latest available data from office national statistics just over three million people were, were employed in the uk's nighttime economy up to almost 50 percent again i'm not too sure i buy this one i'm not sure but again I, I think that if they if they say um if they're saying more people are going out and they're going out on average let's say 50 uh, for three hours 35 minutes uh per night I'm going to assume it's probably to do with bars and pubs. I'm not going to say it's going to be nightclubs because I'm out a lot and I don't see that many people going out to nightclubs unless it's like big ticket people playing in nightclubs for the most part. Uh, big ticket names, DJs or artists, whoever they may be. They're not necessarily going out casually to go see a resident DJ playing some nondescript bar. Unless they happen to be there, they're not necessarily going there for a night out. I've not seen, in my own personal humble opinion. Now, I would say that the casual bar attendance, the kind of thing that you do after work on a Wednesday to a Thursday, uh, well, Wednesday to a Friday, has, has gone up a lot. I've seen a lot more people out and about... Um, in bars and stuff after work and probably spending more um on average on those nights and then kind of fobbing off going to a night out because if you think about it like i'm gonna go see nina kravitz play this friday right at the wolfenstone assembly and that's like what 25 or let's say it's 30 quid to go ticket by the time i spend on my drinks and all my other stuff i'm probably looking at about 100 quid right spending cost in terms of the uber back home in terms of maybe some food on the way back home and drinks I'm saying, you know, roughly spending £100, but it might be more. Um, if you're a regular schmegular Joe and, you you know, you, you, you do like electronic music, don't get me wrong, but you get your kicks from going out and meeting your friends instead of how I do. I, I like going out into the dark abyss and dancing my head, you know, until my head comes off my shoulders. But if you don't, if, if you're not that bothered about going to see Nina Kravitz and you just want to see her play on YouTube or something, watch a boiler room set and just jam with your friends at home, have some drinks. You could easily do that in a bar and kind of take that 100 quid and probably divide that over three nights, right? You could probably spend 30 quid, 40 quid a night in a bar or a pub and have just as bad as a good a good of a time and you have to pay an entry fee. 
Um, I'm seeing a lot of that happening lately. And of course, some, some of it might have to do with ages and stuff and people getting older. But I'm seeing a lot of younger people, especially when I go to Weatherspoon, especially if I go to like a, a pub around the corner that I go to here recently that shows a lot of football. I'm seeing a lot more people hang around in like more stodgy, old kind of, you know, um, pubs and bars just because it's cheaper overall than going to a nightclub now they could probably still go to a nightclub after right you could, you could still go to a, a cheap bar um drink four pint pint and then maybe head off to a nightclub but it's unlikely that you'd do that right you sound like that you'd go from the middle of homerton all the way down to uh, brixton to go to flipping i don't know um phonox or something and go and rave it's not likely someone will do that but i like um I like this change. I like the change. I think in general, what it means is that people are maybe having better drinking um, behaviors when they're going out, maybe for the most part, because I know for, for me, when I used to go out um, a lot, especially to nightclubs and stuff, the one thing that used to always bum me out was the level of aggression, the level of just messiness that happened in nightclubs because people were just getting absolutely slaughtered, right? They weren't really necessarily enjoying the night out. They weren't enjoying the ambiance or the DJs or the atmosphere they were in. They are just in there to get fucking hammered. And it kind of ruined the clubbing experience. But I think nowadays, even though clubs are not as full as they once were, unless, again, unless, like, the top 20, so the top 10 to 20 DJs are playing, um, they're not as busy as they once were. I think the people that are in there are there for the best intentions. They're there because they love underground electronic music. They're there because they love the culture. They love the DJ. They love the label. They want to support this, support the promoter, support the club. Um, you're not necessarily getting the casual kind of fly by night people just hanging out because they just want to, you know, um, have something to post on Instagram. For the most part, they are going to nice bars and pubs around the area. And again, these dining options too. Um, there's a plethora of restaurants opening now at the moment that have. Um, uh bar service or they have like a nice counter bar right where you can go and order like a uh bar menu for the most part have some nibbles have a drink talk to a bartender and and roll away your night in that respect right loads of them have that kind of thing in there because i know a lot of people like to do that sort of stuff there's that kind of a, there's an in-between there's an in-between ground between sitting in a pub on your own and maybe going to like a nice kind of you know italian restaurant that has like a counter bar ordering a glass of wine having some olives and chilling and having a good time um again um, i think there needs to be more investment maybe put into night into nightlife economy in terms of when it comes to clubs and stuff and allowing them and allowing clubs to kind of um operate in this environment because i think with all this money flying around people being able to spend a little bit more with the, maybe the average income rising little by little because people are not maybe spending as much as they would do on material items and shit i think clubs need to kind of profit off that too and i'd like to see some parity being equated back to nightclubs and not just see it all kind of go into bars and pubs and the restaurants because they're easy to deal with i want to see clubs as well have the opportunity to kind of get some of that dollar because i think for the most part if we have options like for instance like there is no alibi anymore right there's no like version of alibi that exists right and imagine an alibi that exists on all three grades, an alibi that exists for kids that are just, I don't know, within their first three to four years of university, right? There needs to exist a place for them to go to where it's like a safe space for young kids to go and hang out, go get crazy, not get judged and be be nuts, you know, try things out. There needs to be, a club, there needs to be a, an alibi type club for um, people maybe my age, right? Um, let's say from, let's say 25 to 35. And it needs to be an alibi for people maybe a little bit older than that, 35 to 45, right? That might just be a pub for the most part. But there needs to be an alibi for each of those kind of ages, a place that you can go to, like a fucking dive bar that's really cool. You can just hang out and just have a good time and chill out until the um, wee hours at night. But it doesn't exist, unfortunately. It's just, you know, this nonsense that we have now at the moment, which is, again, which is annoying. But I think, by and large, over the years, things are starting to improve. And I think we're going to see a little bit more of an improvement the, the more the years progress, especially with the advent of festivals coming in every other day. Hopefully, anyway, I'm hoping that kind of happens. Um, next on the docket here, Supreme Nike Tailwind. Are you guys bothered? Do you guys care? These are already out already, I think. I think they've already... They, they, no, yeah, they came out already. I'm pretty sure there's only the white pair available now at the moment. Um, but again, I'm a, I'm a big fan of these. Again, um, I like what Supreme do with their Nike collaborations, right? They could easily, easily make an Air Max 1 and just fucking clean up shop, right? Every season, just make the same old shit. But I like how sometimes they can grab stuff from the archives. I'm not sure if this is the time with Air Max Day and they were kind of given this and told, hey, promote this. Because usually there's always a plan in place with Nike, right? They allow a brand like Supreme to come around, do a collaboration on the Tailwind. And then the, usually the idea behind that is that Supreme will do like a tier zero release of this kind of shoe. And then Nike will have like a plethora of shoes that are basically tier, tier zero or GR. 
um, that are then going to come and flood the market between for like the next 12 to 18 months. And they're going to see which one works, if, if they work or not, if they're getting good sales and shops. And if they're not, they'll pull them and you won't see them ever again. If they are, they'll see them get flooded in all kinds of shapes and sizes. As we're seeing with the Nike Reacts 87s, right? There's there, there, there's too many Nike Reacts out there for, for, for probably feet. They noticed that they were going well. But I like what Supreme do in terms of taking a, a few more risks with the shoes. Um, the Tailwind's a classic Air Max, I think, for most Air Max lovers out there. It's a really... Um, it's a really um, deep cut in terms of um, London centric Air Max shoes. I like how they kind of did it with the. Um, I like how they did it with the, the the lookbook too. I'm assuming that's a BMW too. I mean, a boy wearing a BMW with some tracksuits on when Air Max is a classic kind of Air Max look. I, I, I'm actually a fan of the white and red pair more so than the the other black pair personally for me. Um, again, nice sort of free M details all over it. Um, great shoe, I think, for the most part. I think if you again, if you're an Air Max fan, these are things I just like. You know, they go out go without saying. Again, I like the white part. The white shoe looks really nice. It makes the sole look super, super thick, doesn't it? I'm mean, really, really good, big fan of the white shoe. Um, but again, if you're a fan of Air Maxes, I think these are an, an, an easy cop for you. And again, they go away from the whole like you know Air Maxes and Air Max One, um, Air Max One, Air Max Ninety kind of mold, Air Max Ninety Five mold. They're a little bit more, you know, something a little bit more snazzy, a little bit different than what's on the market now. And again, something that maybe isn't as hype as some of the other because I'm sure I saw the white and red pair still available in the online store, so it must mean. Most of the hype beasts aren't necessarily that keen on them as they should be. But again, the TN hats, which are always a big uh, thing for me when I was in school. I remember during Foot Locker days, they used to sometimes sell tracksuits with a hat all together. They were fucking so much money. I think they must have been like £150 plus or whatever. Some of those tracksuits, if, if somebody if somebody was able to, if somebody bought loads of old school um, Foot Locker tracksuits from back in the day, the TN ones, You'd be so rich right now if you had an archive full of those old tracksuits. Like they were fucking insane. They made some of the best tracksuits ever um, back in those days, but they were so expensive too. They were they were essentially like a form of luxury, if you think about it as well. Like only only the trappers in my ends had um, those uh, kind of tracksuits for the most part. And I think even back then, Nike weren't that keen on on giving people free clothes. I remember, if I remember, for the most part. There were a few people that were giving them, but if I'm sh if I remember in the grime scene, I think Adidas was the kind of the first brand to kind of seed guys and girls. And now look at it, Nike are kind of falling over themselves to kind of give guys and girls um free shoes. And it? it's weird. It's funny how things change over the years. But yeah, I'm a big fan of these Nike Tailwind fours. Um, I recommend you check them out. Really nice shoe. I'm sure most people listening to the podcast have already seen them, but you know, since I've had a week off, I thought I'd kind of mention them now. Um, next on the docket here, what else do we have? We're winding up soon. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, uh, Charlie Hunum Triple Frontier. Okay, so um, do you do you guys know who Charlie? How do you pronounce his name? Is it Charlie Hunum? Charlie Hunum. Yeah, Charlie Hunum is um. You know Charlie Hunnam is? He's an actor. Um, he was um, famous for acting uh, acting as Jack Teller in Sons of Anarchy, one of my most favorite TV shows ever. A, sh a show that was so good, it made me consider getting a motorbike. And if you know me personally, you know that I'm the biggest pussy in the world. So for me to consider getting a motorbike based on the show I'm watching must mean a lot. But um, um, Charlie Hume plays Jack Teller, who's kind of the lead, kind of, you know, the, the quote unquote leader of um, Sons of Anarchy, which kind of based on this motorcycle gang. Um, it's a really good um, TV series. I recommend you check it out. But overall, he's a really interesting actor because for the most part, he's extremely private. He doesn't really, he rarely does interviews, uh, keeps himself to himself, and he's all about the craft. And in a world where most celebrities are kind of, you know, um, I, I think it's different in acting. Acting, for the most part, they do try to ha maintain an air of mystique about them. But I think nowadays with everyone kind of, you know, segueing over to social media land, we you know we see what happened with Will Smith, how he kind of segued into kind of being an influence on social media, um, seeing um in order to kind of help uh, garner attention for the movies that he's doing. Um, I think in that kind of world or in that kind of era, to have like an actor like Charlie Hunnam, who's like for the most part extremely private, trying to keep himself to himself, is really really refreshing. And um, he recently did this movie um called Triple Frontier that's out now on Netflix. It stars Ben Affleck. It stars the dude from Narcos. It stars a couple of other people, like it's fucking stellar, stellar lineup of a, of a movie. Now, for me personally, I watched it the other day. It's not that great. It's not the best movie ever. I think it got sold. It, it kind of sold me a, a dream. It's probably a lot more. It probably looks better than a trailer. It doesn't actually a movie. It's not offensive. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I guess for the most part, it's not as it doesn't feel as um special of a moment as it probably should do. Maybe it's because of Netflix. I don't know. Maybe it's because of that. But you know, it's not as good as I thought it would be. But I like the story that's been told of it of these kind of you know retired ex Navy SEALs who are kind of pulled back into um into the action for kind of one last job. And it kind of speaks about you know the things that we hear nowadays about you know how how little they're paid, the the lack of um um 
lack of purpose they have once they come back off duty um loads of really interesting kind of psychological things that you never really think about um when you know you know of course if you haven't been involved in the, in the army but he did a really good interview um prior to the film movie's release um, with men's health because he spoke about you know the kind of physical condition that he kind of gets himself into and he's very stringent on physical conditioning and really kind of get himself into character and i think he did it a lot with king arthur he did it with a movie before previously where he kind of cut down to maybe 13 stone he's probably the same height as me so that's extremely skinny and then he spoke about it a bit more when it came to this movie triple frontier and he kind of boxed up a bit more to kind of have that kind of robust rotund kind of um, navy seal sort of look and um, throughout the whole interview he kind of speaks really glowingly about his training practices but the most one of the best parts i think i'm going to get up here on the screen um he speaks about let me see if i can get on here no Da, 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 da. he also speaks about his admiration for jordan peterson right somebody who i've been a real big fan of um and kind of the books that he reads and stuff and again i i, I just like that you know i mentioned it previously in the beginning of the podcast that you know i found it a bit difficult these last couple of weeks to kind of maintain motivation and kind of keep going and doing the things i'm doing because you know i'm seeing little to low, little to no progress in some of the things i'm doing but i like that sometimes you read these interviews with these high achieving people and you start to realize that you know the biggest the people that you want to emulate the ones that are kind of your motivation your inspiration are doing the things that you're doing right just need to keep keep your head down keep on course and you'll be fine and there's a bit where he mentions um about the books that he reads and and it's all basically um the books that i'm um, really into right so um this is his chapter this is a bit on jordan peterson right where is it Uh, where is it Let's see, Peterson. Oh, where is it? There. Okay. Uh, in Triple Frontier, you're playing a spit. This is a, this is an interview from um, Men's Health Magazine, right? So uh, the title is, uh, this is what Charlie Hunnam's training was like for Triple Frontier. And they do that for most of these kind of movies. They have like a mental health article that kind of talk about the training the guys did for it. Because I think most dudes, when they go watch these movies, they're like, oh shit, how did you get that ripped? Right, that's what we were thinking about. But anyway, it says here the following. Um, in Triple Frontier, you're playing a former Special Forces soldier and you worked a lot with a steel trainer. What did you learn from that experience? And Charlie says the following. I really love the sense of seriousness with those guys. There's no sense of there's no sense of life being trivial. There's no flippancy, no triviality to those guys. They were just very, very serious. I really enjoyed that. I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson, as are a lot of people right now. He's become quite an internet phenomenon, a card-carrying member of the intellectual dark web. I love the message that he promotes which is take your life seriously, carry as much responsibility as you can. And I think in his world, he says, pick up the heaviest thing that you can and carry it. This is what, this is what, this was very much the philosophy and mentality of these special forces guys. I really enjoy being around that sensibility in this day and age. Everyone's grown soft and entitled. It's like, no guys, you're not entitled to anything. It's like, be your fruits. It's like by your fruits, you shall know them. It's like a, a famous Bible scripture. And that, and that just speaks to the importance of getting out there and working for yourself. L- from living in Hollywood and being exposed to a lot of people of the film industry, I found the attitude of those special forces guys to be really, really refreshing, which is kind of an awesome take, right? And something that I kind of, again, thought about a lot in my life, um, that kind of level of seriousness and having that, uh, having involving, adopting a level of seriousness in your work that is kind of really abnormal, right? Doing the, I think, um, to achieve, what's that go- quote something about to achieve um impossible goals you have to do the impossible thing right or the abnormal thing um and i think that is what is needed right for the most part and i think if you listen to jocko warnick's podcast um who writ extreme ownership um you get that sense of seriousness with him it can sometimes be a bit heavy and a little bit too much but i think there's something about there's something in that kind of idea of like taking your work very seriously being very methodic about the things that you do when it comes to training when it comes to diet when it comes to what what you drink, when you drink, right? Like now I've decided um, these last couple of weeks, especially after I had my little bit of a hiccup of last week that I'm not going to have any alcohol in the house. If I want to drink, I have to go outside to have a beer. Or I have to go outside to have a bit, not having any bottles of anything in my house. Like really being sent, really being strict of how you kind of regiment your week, how you regiment your life. And then hoping that that kind of will transpire into the things that you're doing outside of it. And I think there is something to it. There's something to it. And again, it can be intense. It can put people off. But I think in this day and age where everyone is quite trivial, and there is a lot of flippancy and there is a lot of flip floppancy and people are getting really committed to like for instance like think about the Chloe Kardashian and Tristan Thomas thing that happened the other week right a couple weeks ago it was all over the news right Jordan Woods on a red table everyone's talking about it. it's the fucking biggest news ever you can't get away from it everyone's involved everyone's talking about it what now right what now 
people are wasting so much time worrying about things that were not within their control things that have nothing to do with themselves right things that are going to just distract you from the overall goal that you're missing you're missing the target you're getting yourself confused and distracted by all this other nonsense outside when it doesn't really matter when if you're really serious about what you do you're going to be like look i god bless those guys um i hope they work things out but i need to get my life in order and that's basically the name of the game and that's what i like from what charlie Hume said here in this interview and it continues as well um scroll down here Da, 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 da. He says here, okay. Oh, where's where he mentioned again, Jordan Peterson? Da, 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 he says he mentions it again here. Okay, yeah. You mentioned um, Jordan Peterson as somebody uh, whose philosophy you find interesting. And again, you have to mention, you have to remember, right? When you when you had this interview, he got a lot of stick on on social because you know Jordan Peterson is like the he's like the black cross. He's he's, he's at the he's at the cross symbol um, for leftists, right? And they really hate him. I don't know why. Again. I think some, so maybe sometimes they misconstrue the stuff that he said about Bill 616 and um, uh, using pronouns and stuff. I think maybe they misconstrue some of the stuff. But for the most part, he's, you know, he's somebody that I've kind of looked up to for a long, long time. He's brought, brought me a lot of value. I've gone to see him speak. I'm going to see him speak again when he comes in um, the UK in June. But anyway, um, he got a lot of stick when he mentioned the fact that he's a big fan of Jordan Peterson. But the, the fact that he's not on social media, the fact that he doesn't really do any interviews, He's probably not going to ever find out that this he got that much stick, and I love that that side of um, Charlie in the first place. But he says this in the following: He says um, the interview asked him, um, "You mentioned Jordan Peterson as somebody first of all you find really interesting. Who else um, do you read when you're looking for eye of the tiger mentality, preparing your role for like this?" Um, he says the following: um, "In my thirties, I've become pretty vicarious reader, which is again something late in life. This is why I like these interviews with people that I guess, I guess a good cheat method. I guess I feel I mentioned it a few times, people." But a good cheat method in order to kind of get to where you want to get to is to read interviews of people that you look up to. Usually, by and large, right? By and large, usually they're doing things right. And they're going to give you a little nugget, a little insight into something that you could be doing that you could apply to your life that would also help you to get to who you want to get to. Just read more interviews. Whether it's an interview or autobiography, read more personal accounts of people they look up to. And trust me, trust me, they'll give you the keys. And none of this look into other influencers who are doing bullshit stuff no fuck them look at the look at the look at what the influencer is looking at like who's their person that they're targeting go to that person read what they're reading don't go to don't get second information from those guys for the most part they're just chances in my opinion um here we go in my 30s i become pretty precarious reader i read a lot of fiction for the lot uh for the for the love of it and i read a lot of non-fiction specific to this experience i read a lot of Sebastian younger i read that book too called tribes it's fucking awesome um a couple of times which i think is an exceptional book i read Sebastian younger's war which i also have also read i read joker wernick extreme ownership which i have as well down here somewhere right da, 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 da. where is it extreme ownership. got so many books i don't know where they are so many books where is it? I had it somewhere here. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Ba, ba, ba. I got it here. It's a stream ownership. You can see it on the screen. I'm going to put it up there because I spent too much time getting it and it doesn't make no sense. But yeah, there's me. Look, all the books that I have, he has too. And I love this guy. I, I didn't know he'd read this much. This is, the first interview I've, this is the first interview I've read of him from a while where he's mentioned the books he reads. I had no idea he was into this sort of shit. Um, again, it makes sense for Triple Frontier because it's based on Navy SEALs and this is, you know, Joker Wernick is a Navy SEAL or was a Navy SEAL. Um, he always Navy SEAL, right? I'm sure. Anyway, um, um, how Navy SEALs lead and win. Um, I read on killing, which I've I've read. I've read that psychological. No, I've not read that. I've not the last two. I haven't read. Um, and you know what I'm gonna read next, right? Since he's kind of mentioned these kind of books. Um, and he and he reads the following. Um, so I read a lot of military oriented stuff. It's always specific to the role, just for my own education and enjoyment. I read a lot of books about human condition, particularly the human condition in relation to spiritual practice. Mostly helps me in my life. Life is very very complicated. I agree. Um, I subscribe to I subscribe to hell and to I subscribe to hell and heaven on earth. I think that the axiom of life is that life is suffering. That's what all the great religions have taught us. So I think there's a personal responsibility. All Almost like a campaign to try every day to balance the scales to derive as much meaning from sense of individualistic purpose as we can. That's in a nutshell my philosophy and general outlook. I fucking love it. I love him, and I'm a big fan of him. I love him and everything that he does. And yeah, man, Charlie Hunnam, man, the fucking absolute legend that is the legend, Charlie Hume. Um, great interview. It's on now. It's on um, again. It's it's just refresh. Just nice to read an interview with somebody that you look up to that you like, and then to find out that they are you know they are who you imagine them to be right there's something about that and again i don't want to meet the guy or i don't want to never meet your heroes i'm that kind of i like to keep my people um at arm's length and i'm sure you would not give a flying fuck about me but i just like when you find out that someone you look up to is fucking cool as shit 
and they like the stuff that you like because it kind of gives you an understanding of like, oh, now I see what I saw. N- n- now I know why I saw something in him that I liked that I kind of wanted to follow. Um, and again, the idea that he's not on social media, that he's a bit, he's a bit of a unicorn in that sense, right? Because he looks really good on camera. He could easily be on social, parading his family and, you know, showing off and he probably could get more roles that way too. He's probably missing out on a lot, not getting, not probably missing out on a lot of roles, not being on social. And I'm sure his manager agents have told him that, but he's made a, his mission to kind of put his flag in the ground, to be a serious actor, do serious things, read a lot, train a lot, and just commit himself to any side of role he does. And for the most part, the fruits of his labor have been shown. Um, and yeah, I recommend you check out Triple Frontier. It's available on Netflix again. Like I said, it's not the best movie in the world, but it's an easy watch if you want to watch something on a weekend and you're, you know, you're just chilling out with your friends or whatever it may be. Uh, Triple Frontier out now on Netflix. It starts Ben Affleck too. Ben Affleck's really good in it too, actually, which is, people always say that because I think for the most part, people, you know, tend to discount Ben Affleck and, you know, because, you know, you can, he's a bit of a, you know, not the coolest dude in the world and maybe the thing after Sam Harris might have tamed him a bit but um, Ben Affleck there's no denying Ben Affleck's a good actor and that movie he kind of reminds us of that fact again um, what else is on here I should be really jetting off shouldn't I it's already yeah, it's getting late um, bu- 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 yeah I think I'm going to leave it there actually because I think I've got to be jetting off actually because time's really running out but that's 50 minutes right good 50 minutes yeah cool 50 minutes Boom. Thanks so much for tuning in to Exynos Zinger Show, episode number 171. It's been an honor to have you by my side in your earlobes, in front of your screens, wherever it may be. For those of you watching on YouTube, click like and subscribe. Let your friends know, leave a comment, blah, de, blah. If you're watching, we're listening on a podcast app, leave me a five star review and all that nice stuff, malarkey. For stuff regarding me and links and all that stuff, visit my website, exynoszinger.com. All there, all the links is on there, everything where it may be. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Exynos Zinger Show, episode number whatever it may be um before that take care love who you love and i'll see you guys very soon why would i say love who you love does that make it even sense it doesn't but who cares take care have a good one peace